The Congressional Progressive Caucus is 25 years old. So what's it like to be in your mid-20s under a Donald Trump administration? Not so long ago, I had a chance to attend the CPC Summit in Baltimore. I'm Laura Flanders. I'm here at the Congressional Progressive Caucus Summit in Baltimore 2017 with two who represent the past, present, and future of this caucus. Representative Barbara Lee represents California's 13th district, that's Oakland and Berkeley in the Bay Area. Mark Pocan represents Wisconsin's second. He is the first vice co-chair of the Progressive Caucus. And the last time we saw him, we were sitting in his office during the Madison uprising. Absolutely. <laughs> so Barbara, take us back, just a little bit of history. The Progressive Caucus, you were there at the birth. 1991, well, somewhere in there? Well, I worked for former Congressman Ron Dellums, a great warrior who was one of the founders of the Congressional Progressive Caucus. And he had this vision along with the founders of bringing together groups of uh, individual members of Congress to put together a progressive agenda on Capitol Hill. And here we are 25 years later, uh, the strongest, I think, and the, the largest uh, caucus on Capitol Hill. All right, the strongest, but you have to say when not in a very progressive moment on, on Capitol Hill. No, I would disagree. I think we are. When you look at the votes of the majority of Democrats as it relates to the progressive agenda, votes that the progressive caucus members put forward in terms of amendments and legislation, you'll see that the majority of the Democratic caucus are, are with us. All right. What do you think, Mark? Yeah, absolutely. In fact, when you look at uh, we are the largest values-based caucus within the House Democrats, I think we have something like 14 uh, ranking uh, members on subcommittees and committees. Uh, we've got a lot of power positions within leadership. Um, I think there's a lot of potential. The freshman class that just got elected, I think we're one person shy of a majority of them joining our caucus over all the other uh, caucuses out there. So I see a lot of good, positive movement. All right. So I want to believe. I really want to believe. But people are going to tune into this and say, what plan are these people living on? Donald Trump just got inaugurated. We have horrendous legislation coming at us from every direction. Executive orders are threatening our lives. Why are you feeling so upbeat, Mark? Because we can be that legislative arm of the resistance and everyone else can have not only their voices uh, calling representatives and trying to impact the change they want to, but uh, working with the grassroots groups, you know, double down on any organization that the, they think an issue is at risk with the Trump administration, double down with that group, support that group, um, volunteer with that group, and you can have a magnified voice. So we've had victories already. The first day we beat back uh, a gutting the ethics laws for members of Congress. Uh, we've been able to, because of people, uh, convince a Republican senator from Alaska to vote against Betsy DeVos as nomination for Secretary of Education. We just convinced a Republican not to introduce a bill to sell off millions of acres of public land because people are getting active and, and organized. So I see lots of uh, positive organizing out of this. And in the end, if we can keep and sustain this through 2018, I see some electoral success out of this. Well, absolutely. And let me just say, Mark, it's absolutely correct. And, and I have to come at this being a black woman, an African-American woman in America. And the election, of course, shocked me. And, and for 24 hours, I was pretty down and out. But I have to remember the days when I couldn't even go to public schools because I was black. I remember the days when I had to drink out of the colored only water fountain. My dad was a military officer in the Army. We couldn't even go to restaurants with his uniform on. And so, you know, while this is a major setback, I think the civil rights movement and the movement for human rights is instructive at this point for people who are feeling down and out and what can we do. You know, this is a long-term struggle and we got to fight back and we've got to fight back hard. Well, let's talk long-term. Um, you were the one voice in 2001, the one vote against the congressional authorization for the president, the right to go to war, basically anywhere he wanted, a right that now Donald Trump has. Talk about being that one voice and where you see the fight against militarism, which we don't talk about enough, but permeates this entire situation. Is we need to talk about it more. And that vote was against a blank check. It was an authorization to use force forever <laughs> against any organization, the way it was written, any organization, nation, individual, the president deemed connected to 9-11. Well, let me tell you, that was so overly broad. It, it, 
it was a, a resolution that is no way I could vote for. I had to resist that. You come to moments in your life when you have to say, I've got to do the right thing. This is unconstitutional, it's wrong, it's morally wrong, and it's going to leave us less safe. Because, you know, yes, we have to respond to terrorism and the horrific attacks on our country. But three days after that, you don't pass a blank check just to go to force forever. And here we are now dealing with uh, budgets that uh, set the stage for perpetual war. There's legacy here, though, too, in the same way that you had the foresight to realize, whoa, this 2001 authorization of the use of force bill is going to play out as a disaster over the long term you have insight into the rise of this particular right wing and its agenda through your experience with Governor Scott Walker and, well, the fights where we met around the uh, anti-public worker bill in Wisconsin. Yeah, and, you know, and, and there are some parallels, but also I hope some lessons learned from it. So we had 10, 20, 40,000 people a day during the week. On the weekend, 100,000 people came in to protest, uh, taking away workers' uh, rights to have a, a voice in their workplace. But I think what came out of that is we had a long period before the recalls could legally happen, the recall elections that people wanted to have. And because of that, we didn't have anything to sustain the level of activism, which is something we have to learn out of this lesson is uh, we've got people right now who want to do something. We've got to find ways to make sure they're engaged, not just contacting their, their representatives, but finding those grassroots groups locally and nationally, especially with legal arms so they can challenge these laws, have them double down their time their effort, their support for these organizations because their voice is magnified. And if we can keep them active and show the, the wins they're having, and they are having wins right now, we can sustain that right into 2018. And then, you know, we can put an asterisk after this really bad period of time. What about that? I mean, how do you maintain this momentum? And how do constituents and advocates work with members of Congress like yourself, Barbara? Right now, we have no option but to sustain this momentum, and I, I hope people don't get tired and weary. We have to work with coalitions and people of conscience all around the country, which is the majority of people, to develop you know, strategies and ways to move forward. But uh, yes, contacting members of Congress, emails. Uh, we see what's happening oftentimes when uh, votes come down. You know, members change <laughs> their vote when they hear from their constituencies. And this is about a numbers game also on the inside in terms of making sure we defeat some of these legislative proposals or pass some of the ones that make sense for the majority of the country. What is at stake in this election around the DNC chair? Because one of your close colleagues, co-chair of the Progressive Caucus, Keith Ellison, is up for that position. And a lot of people will take the temperature of the Democratic Party by the way that that candidacy uh, fares. So I, I think a lot of people, when we saw the presidential primaries happen, Bernie Sanders had way more uh, support than I think the establishment folks uh, assumed. And then we saw the grassroots support uh, in funding the campaign and volunteering for the campaign. I think the other thing I learned out of that is you can't have it about a person. It has to be about something broader and bigger, and that's where the Democratic Party can step in. We, are, we have people in every single community across the country, from local elections to state offices to federal offices. Keith gets that. Keith's the perfect intersection of someone who is an elected official, understands that inside game, but also was part of that movement that, that Bernie Sanders had helped to create with his candidacy because people were yearning for that message. So if you can have uh, Keith take over the DNC and build it as a grassroots party. Instead of worrying about, hey, pharmaceutical company, you gave us 100,000 last year, how about 150,000 this year? You build it as a grassroots movement and then you've got not just the financial support, but the volunteer support and the ability to recruit candidates and everything. I just see it as the real uh, the wave of the future if we can take the Democratic Party in that direction, work with us through the Progressive Caucus, work with the public through this movement, the resistance movement, and we can be really successful and defeat everything that Donald So Trump's is he going to win? I think he's working absolutely harder than anyone, and I, you know, I don't have anything against Tom Perez, I, I thought was my favorite cabinet secretary, Former did some Labor great secretary. things within the Department of Labor. Um, I just think for this position, I want someone who is going to be a movement builder. Let me just say, I'm a member of the DNC and have been, uh, so I get a chance to, to vote. And I also was on the drafting committee for the Democratic Party platform. Keith was on the drafting committee also, and I'm going to, and he was a supporter of Bernie's. I had not endorsed because I wanted to help negotiate a progressive platform. And I just want to tell you, first, the Democratic Party platform is the most progressive platform ever. 
uh, Bernie and uh, thank God we had Bernie's people on that platform because we were able to negotiate, I'd say 95% of what a progressive Democratic platform would look like and Secretary Clinton agreed and helped negotiate many of those platform issues. And, and so Keith gets it in terms of the inside outside strategy and in terms of taking the party to the f into the future, making sure that the South uh, is recognized as a, as a region, that we have to build the party, uh, recognize that we have to build the party with millennials who, you know, tend now to become more, tend to vote independent rather than as Democrats. Well, I'm a progressive Democrat, and so I want them into the Democratic Party, and I think that's what Keith will do. So if he doesn't win, I know I'm going to be hearing it from people that say, okay, that's it. If they can't elect him in this, con in this moment, I'm never going to support them ever again. What do you say to them, Barbara? Well, what I say to them is we, it's a long-term struggle. You know, we've got to go to the next stage of our fight. You know, all of the candidates, you know, are good candidates. So I'm not denigrating or taking away from any of the candidates from the DNC, for the DNC chair. But I think people have to really, first of all, believe that they can be the change and, and the power of the people is what's going to take this country forward. Yes, we want a progressive, grassroots-oriented, phenomenal, brilliant chair of our Democratic Party, and that's what we're all working toward. But again, in this democracy, we have, you know, the notion that people's voices, you know, I mean, that's the central tenet to this democracy. It's the people's voices, it's the power of the people that's gonna make the change. So people have to stay engaged regardless of who wins or loses an election for any office. And honestly, people should be joining the party and making the party represent their values. I mean, right, so that's the, the other thing I guess I'd push back, that we need everyone to be as active within the party and make the party then the progressive values that they have. Because if we just leave it to the people who are currently there, if they're not happy, um, then you know, you're kind of checking out of the system. And I think uh, that would be the worst thing. And we just need to keep pushing forward. Yeah, and let me tell you, I didn't want to join the Democratic Party in the early 70s. I mean, I was like working as a community worker with the Black Panther Party. I was president of Black Student Union and I was a revolutionary. And you couldn't tell me, you know, joining and registering to vote was something that would change the, the world. Here comes Shirley Chisholm, African-American woman running for the presidency. And I had a chance to get to know her and she insisted that I register to vote. And she helped, she asked me to work in her campaign. I did, I had a class, I got to end the class when I was gonna fail it because I wasn't gonna work in any of the presidential campaigns. The rest is history. But you know, and my whole deal was trying to make the Democratic Party more inclusive, more democratic and more representative of everyone. And so we can't give up, but I'm gonna continue to push for new people, new voices, more progressive voices, more diverse voices into the party. All right, thank you both. Representatives Lee and Polkan, it's always a pleasure and honor to be with you. Keep up the good thank fight. You. I don't know how you do it, but go for it. <laughs> thank <you>. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks. What's it like being in Congress right now? We'll find out with our next guests. Pramila Jayapal represents Washington's 7th District. Yvette Clark represents New York's 9th. I ask them both, what's it like to be in Washington these days? Tell us a little bit about what you're seeing in your constituency event in these times since the uh, Trump election. Well, we're seeing a range of uh, dynamics taking place. One, Central Brooklyn has to have one of the largest immigrant populations, very diverse immigrant populations in the United States. And uh, of course, we're seeing uh, some fear. Uh, we're seeing immediate reaction to uh, Donald Trump's uh, executive orders, uh, concern about relatives, families, how expansive the executive order will ultimately become. Alongside that, we have a, an activist spirit that has been unleashed. Uh, clearly, when you see people rush to uh, the federal court in Brooklyn uh, to get uh, a stay on, on the order because we saw what was happening immediately uh, at JFK uh, Airport, um, Brooklynites are, are activated. They want to know what they can do. Uh, they're inquiring of our office. We're experiencing uh, calls from constituents at uh, 30 second clips in our office. That is how engaged every 30, we, seconds, every 30 seconds. 
every 30 seconds. And what are you seeing on the other side of the country? Talk about oceans. Uh, you know, a Atlantic lot of the, the same Pacific. things. I mean, I was at the airport on Saturday at 1 o'clock trying to get people off of planes and stop people from being sent back home. Um, and, You're talking you about know, Seattle. Seattle and SeaTac, and thousands of people showed up to the airport yeah. as they did around the country. Nobody called them out there. They just heard that it was happening, and they immediately ran out. So I think the level of activism is incredibly high. Our office is shut down by calls in a good way. I mean, they're all fabulous, engaged calls telling us to fight, telling us to make sure we're protecting people. Um, but same thing, you know, just overwhelmed with calls. But I'll tell you that... There's a tremendous amount of fear across the country, um, and it is really tough for people right now who just feel like they're in limbo. They feel like this, this president and his administration is out to make sure that they do not stay here in this country, or that if they're workers, you know, that they, they feel like everything is being stripped away. Public education, I mean, I've, we've gotten a lot of calls about Betsy DeVos and the terror that people have that this fundamental system of public education, which is so essential for everything else, is going to be destroyed. So how do you understand your job in a moment like that? If, uh, as a member of Congress, you're both at home and you're not at home. Right. Well, we have to use every tool at our disposal. And um, before leaving to come back to Washington, we held a town hall meeting just to begin the education process. We decided that we would uh, provide for my constituents and in, in sort of a finish groups a way in which we can uh, stay in contact with one another and we've established a hot a hashtag Brooklyn resists um, in addition to that town hall meetings and we just want to keep people engaged we want to keep give them an up-to-the-minute update with what is happening in Washington so that as we need to mobilize as we need to get people into Washington as we need to be out on the streets in Brooklyn and Manhattan wherever we need to show up we are ready at a moment's notice to activate uh, our activists uh, in a very very directed action at uh, pushing back on, on the Trump administration. How about you, Pramil? I have to say, you know, on Inauguration Day, I was in Washington and I thought of you. I thought, wow, what a time to come what into a time. Congress. <laughs> I know, what Absolutely. a time to come in. But, you know, sometimes the universe tells you you're supposed to be somewhere, and I'm so proud to have the opportunity to take this platform that I have and use it to continue to the work that I've been doing, fighting for workers and immigrants and refugees. So for us, it's really threefold in terms of what we can do and how I use the platform. First, it's constituent services. I mean, we are getting a lot of calls from people who really need our help on their family situation, and we are doing everything we can to make sure we're responsive to helping constituents deal with their situation in the moment. Secondly, um, it is about resisting and resisting through amplification of each other. So we've been collecting a lot of stories. We've got hundreds of stories. And we're using the office and the platform and the Progressive Caucus platform to really push those stories out. So Yvette and I both, I'm, Jamie Raskin and I are um, co-leading the Progressive, Order, uh, Progressive Caucus special order, which means we have an hour on the floor every week that people, that your listeners can tune into. It's usually the day before the last day of votes. And, you know, if people keep up with us, they can tune in. We have an hour and we pick a topic. And so this last Thursday, it was on the Muslim ban and the executive orders. And people came and spoke. We had a dozen members who spoke. We tell stories on the floor. And then our networks can clip those, those pieces and send them out to their folks so that we're, we're you know, amplifying each other. Um, and then the third is really thinking about what are the bills that we need to introduce, recognizing Listen, we have so few legislative tools in the House minority. That's Absolutely. what that's what I found out is it's yeah. all directed to make sure the power is in the hands of the majority. But what we do have is the court of public opinion. And so if we can introduce bills to show what our vision is, and that's both to push back on what's happening with Donald Trump, but also to um, put forward a positive vision, you know, of uh, a, a, an infrastructure package that really does work for all of us or, or um you know, immigrant rights, access to counsel. I'm working on an access to counsel bill. I mean, things like that that really show the American people what we're fighting for, then that's also really important. We'll talk a little bit more about constituency services, because certainly if you go to other countries and you look at their political organizations, they're quite often related to direct services. I mean, if you want to talk about the growth of political parties in the Middle East and in Africa and Latin America, there's direct assistance that's yeah. being uh, provided to constituencies, sometimes at the level of soup kitchens and healthcare, but certainly advice. What does that 
look like here? Because I think a lot of us don't have much of a sense of how we connect with our Congress person. Well, the, the expectation is that we will have some level of uh, communication with the federal agencies that impact on the lives of our constituents. So uh, uh, General Kelly, uh, who is now head of the Homeland Security Department, uh, that's uh, USCIS, that's CBP, uh, he has to respond to our inquiries. So if I, I have a constituent who contacts my office, they are expecting their family member to be at JFK, and that person has been turned around, well then, uh, Mr. Kelly has to explain to me why that person was turned around and how we get that person rightfully back here. So Congressman Gerald Nadler and Nidia Velasquez actually went out to JFK. When Absolutely, that and, and that's what really alerted, I think, most Americans to what this implementation actually meant. For me, it's really about the logistical piece of getting the offices going. And we get a lot of constituent services, also things like Social Security and health care benefits. And to me, as an organizer, it's a great opportunity to show people that government really matters. How do you work to use this moment to actually jump us further into the future? Well, I think it's the most important time for us to express our vision. You know, the vision that I ran on for the campaign is still the vision that I have today. It's still the vision that Donald Trump and his administration is undercutting. And so to tie what's happening now as the threat to that vision that we're working for, that big vision, right? Not just restoring the Affordable Care Act, but actually moving to a Medicare for all system. Not just uh, thinking about how we stop Betsy DeVos from destroying public education, but thinking about how we invest in early childhood and K-12 and, and debt-free college. There is, uh, I believe, uh, an opportunity here for us to really galvanize uh, the, the base of Americans. And I won't say party label because I think people of goodwill uh, will recognize that this is an opportunity for us to move our nation in the 21st century to drop a lot of the baggage that we've been carrying from the 20th century on back and, and look at this United, the United States of America as a place that can set an example for the rest of the world. Obviously, the two of you support Keith Ellison as the chair of the Democratic National Committee. A lot of people in the country are looking to this selection of DNC chair as an indicator of where the party is. Does it want progressives? Does it not want progressives? If he does not get this position, is this still your party? I think it's going to be really tough if he doesn't get it. And I'm, I'm, you know, I think the other candidates, there's some other good candidates there, but I do think that this is not just about what he says but what his vision is for how we transform the Democratic Party through organizing. Keith is an organizer. He knows how to talk to people. You know, my, uh, I have somebody on my staff who says that her mother's from Minnesota, voted for Trump, but also loves Keith Ellison. So Keith knows how to talk to regular working people, um, families across the country. He knows how to integrate race and gender and class, and he understands what it means to actually build a movement. And that is what people want to see. Keith Ellison is my classmate. We were both elected to Congress at the same time, and I've had the opportunity to stand shoulder to shoulder with Keith on a myriad of issues, whether it was comprehensive immigration reform or the ACA. And, and one of the things that I have been really fascinated by that he has implemented in Minnesota is a grassroots movement to register people to vote, the basic fundamentals. And if you can organize and lift uh, the voter rolls uh, in every part of this nation, you're the person for the job. And the people ultimately are going to have a lot of leverage in this because you know, the party can say whatever they want, but if people start to leave the Democratic Party because of what happens in the election, and I'm not just talking about, you know, people who are already elected, but I'm talking about regular folks who rank disengage even more, the rank and file, then um, in some ways that is going to provide even more leverage for us to be able to say, all right, we need to dramatically transform what's happening. So I, I don't know what's going to happen, but people have a lot of power in this decision. 
uh, both to tell the people who are going to take votes on this election that this is how they want them to vote and they're going to hold them accountable, but also even once the election happens, either if Keith is elected or if he's not, the power still does reside in people either building the Democratic Party or fleeing the Democratic Party. All right. Thank you both. Great talking to you. Good Thank luck to you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Laura Flanders at the Congressional Progressive Caucus Summit in Baltimore 2017. Thanks for watching. Mm -hmm.